job, y'all. Well, good morning, church. How y'all doing this morning? Would y'all stand up, greet some people around you, and then we're going to worship some together.
brought deliverance to the exodus of my heart. Cause you found me, you freed me, held back the waters for my release. Oh, Yahweh, you're the God. Cause you're the God who fights for me, Lord. church today is uh if you don't know today is my last day at shelby christian and i wanted to take this time to share just share my heart a little bit with you guys for communion and 
it's pretty it's a pretty simple thought but it's just something that i think god's put on my heart because it's important for us to know that throughout all the songs that we've sung throughout all the worship experiences that we've gone through together the main message on my heart that i've worked so hard to communicate while i'm here is that no matter what you've done or what's been done to you god loves you regardless and through communion through jesus's death and burial and resurrection he he proved that he proved his love for us through the cross so today as we take communion would you reflect with me remember the times that we've had together and how ultimately god has been working not only in your all's lives but in my life through you guys and be thankful for it so let's pray father i'm grateful grateful to have this room full of people here that, that i call my family and god i'm thankful for these past two years and everything that you've taught me through the through these past two years through these people god God, if these people remember nothing else out from my time here, may they remember just your love that you've shown through our worship together. Would they remember the sacrifice that you made and the love that you showed through that? God, we remember today. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. Yeah. 
celebrate that victory today, would y'all grab a seat and take a look at this video? Good morning, Shepherd Christian. My name is Luke Dove. I'm one of your Together Partners. I'm a youth pastor here in Guatemala at the Catalino Ministry, which serves impoverished and vulnerable students and their families in the communities where they live. Just wanted to record this and say thank you, first and foremost for your prayers, but also for your support. And I say you pray about and consider uh, donating to the Together offering, which is coming up. That money allows us to do what we do and continue in ministry year round, and not just us, but ministries all over the world. So I'd ask that you pray about that and see if God has put that on your heart. But thank you so much for, for your support up until this point in these last eight months and the prayers and messages that you guys send as a huge encouragement. So thank you so much. I hope you all have a Merry Christmas, and I'll see you soon. Thanks. I love that we get to see... Uh, our own folks that have been a part of our church family uh, and to be a sending church that's sending. And last week, you got to see uh, Ryan and hear about what he's doing. Uh, Luke uh, will be actually be home around Christmas and be able to share with us a little bit more about the, the bags that went down there. We've got a video from Joe and Ashley. We've got a video we're going to show uh, coming up that Jason did when he was up at the church that we helped start in Rhode Island. I just love being able to be a part of those and know that it's like our family that is just boots on the ground in these places making a huge, huge difference. I'm so glad you guys are here this morning. I'm glad we got to worship together. I'm glad we got to sing that song because I just love the, the idea behind it. And sometimes we, we sing things and we don't even realize that they're straight from Scripture. Uh, that, that, that song is straight from the book of Genesis chapter 50. When Joseph is, is sold by his uh, brothers into slavery, and it seems like such a horrible thing, and then at just the right time, when there was a famine, he was in just the right place to be able to provide food. And the Bible says in Genesis 50 and verse 20, it says that what the enemy meant for evil, God intended for good. God used for good. And I'm convinced he does that in our lives if, because there is, there's a lot of evil in the world. Have you noticed? There's a lot of messed up stuff in our world. There's a lot of messed up stuff being done in churches in our world. There's just some stuff that, that God is going to work because he's faithful. He says he'll work all things out for the good. Those who love him are called according to his purpose. And he'll work even the bad things and he'll turn them to the good. So I love when we can sing and we can know something that comes straight from Scripture. Uh, let me just real quick, because it's important, because it's today. You guys already heard from Sweet Spirit. They'll be doing their Christmas concert uh, tomorrow night at 6.30 right in here. And right here this morning, as soon as this service is over, over in the gymnasium is our, and I've always got to get it right, our Christmas couples coffee those C's all together. Okay uh, Christmas couples coffee uh, And the 1130 service over in the gym and it's just all about marriage and, and working on that And it's a really cool time to meet some other couples and the fellowship and the network and all that So uh, you don't have to have signed up if you want to go just head on over there as soon as this service is over And then ladies, we've got a special event for you this afternoon uh, I guess dudes could come but it's mainly a ladies women's ministry thing you'll tie in yarn it's a craft day once again just to make some christmas crafts but probably more importantly than the crafts is the fellowship and the networking and ladies getting to know each other and build some bonds and some friendships and so that's from three to five this afternoon okay uh just right out there in the common ground area it'll get transformed as soon as uh this uh, as soon as services are over this morning and then just let me remind you next sunday when you get here next Sunday, be ready. Everybody in the room has to find a new seat next Sunday, okay? Everybody, because not a single seat will be where it is right now. This whole place gets blown up and transformed on Tuesday. Uh, the stage will be in the center. We're doing Christmas in the round. It's going to be so, so cool. But that does mean that you'll need to find a new, and I know that, I know some of you have been sitting basically in the same spot for 15 years. I get that. I get that. But work with us for four weeks. Actually, there might be a chair kind of in the same spot, but it might be turned in the other direction. So so you might be facing the middle, but it's going to be a really, really cool event. And so I want to remind you about that. I want to, this, this week I got a letter, somebody shared with me, I didn't get the letter, somebody shared with me 
a story about a letter that was written by a nine-year-old son uh, who's actually a friend. This guy knows the family, all right? And this nine-year-old boy wrote this letter to his parents, all right? It starts off, Dear Nick and Melissa, now that should in and of itself tell you something, and not dear mom and dad or dear folks. Dear Nick and Melissa, I, Lincoln, your oldest son, respectfully request raising my weekly allowance by five to ten dollars a week. While I sincerely appreciate your generous weekly stipend, that cracked me up, <laughs> your generous weekly stipend, it's simply not enough to address my financial goal of becoming a millionaire by the time I am 50. Thank, <laughs> thank you for your consideration. Respectfully yours, Lincoln. I can't decide if I want to meet that kid or if he scares me to death. <laughs> I don't know where it is. That, but here's what I know. He recognizes that what he does with whatever money he has now impacts his future and what his future will look like. And so today we're completing the, the series that we've been doing on generosity that we've called From Wall Street to Your Street. And it's been all about the difference in the world's perspective on finances, Wall Street, and God's perspective on finances, your street. And so as we've been going through this, uh, this transformation or this, this journey from Wall Street to your street, we've talked about how we had to go through these different intersections, different intersections along the way. The first intersection was the intersection between generosity and uncertainty. Between generosity and so I want to really do something generous. I want to do something, but I don't know what, you know, I don't want to like, I, I may need that money later. I don't know what the market's going to do. I don't know. So I just, I'm going to, I'm not going to be quite as generous because of the uncertainty of the world. The second intersection that we talked about last week was the intersection of generosity and responsibility and, and, and taking care of what we do have and, and, and being responsible in the way that we help others because that's what we are called to do. There is a responsibility that's tied to that. And then today we want to go to another intersection and it's the intersection between generosity and prosperity. And so, well, this was not about me because I, I haven't prospered at all. Yeah, in our own ways, at our own levels, we've all prospered. And there's an important distinction that we have to keep our eyes on. There's a distinction between God saying that he has plans to prosper us and a prosperity gospel that is being falsely taught in all kinds of places that if you will just like do this then god's just gonna like you sow this seed and god's just gonna do this incredible and boom and now that that some of that is just not in there see stewardship stewardship is not just a matter of letting go of what we have i think that's where we where we lose sight it's all about giving it's all about it's not just that it's it, 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 not even if it's for a worthy or a noble cause. Stewardship is all about giving wisely, investing carefully, planning sensibly, saving with discernment so that we'll have even more to share as God allows us and calls us to be generous. It's about being wise with all that we do have. So we've said through this whole series, we were going to just be in two chapters of the Bible. We're going to be in 2 Corinthians 8 and 9. In the last two weeks, we've been in chapter 8. So today, if you got a Bible, open to 2 Corinthians chapter 9. And we're going to be in the first 11 verses of 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 9. And it's really, I'll, I'll just let you know, uh, he's going to repeat himself. He's going to repeat himself. I don't think it's because he forgot what he had said. I think it's because he's just trying to reiterate a couple of things and then move into some new areas, okay? And so he starts off in verse 1 and says this. <clears throat> I really don't need to write you about this ministry of giving for the believers in Jerusalem. Remember, this is all about the Corinthian church that's taken an offering to help the Jerusalem church, which was kind of the mother church where the church was started on the day of Pentecost. He, he said, we're, we're taking this offering for the church in Jerusalem, for I know how eager you are to help. And I have been boasting to the churches in Macedonia that you and Greece were ready to send an offering uh, a long time ago, a year ago. In fact, 
it was your enthusiasm that stirred up many of the Macedonian believers to begin giving. So he said, he said, your example has been great. Your example has been great. In fact, your example has motivated other believers to do the same thing that you're doing. It, it's living out. It's actually living out the teaching that Paul gave in 1 Corinthians 11, 1, when he said, you follow me as I follow Christ. And it, that applies to every area of the Christian experience. And in this area of giving, he says, you guys have been doing this and people are following you. And that's a great thing. Okay. Now, verse three says, but I am sending these brothers to be sure you are really ready to give. As I have been telling them that your money is all collected, I don't want to be wrong in my boasting about you. We would be embarrassed, not to mention your own embarrassment, if some Macedonian believers came with me and found that you weren't ready after all I had told them. So I thought I would send these brothers ahead of me to make sure the gift you promised is ready. But I want it to be, catch this, underline this, I want it to be a willing gift not given grudgingly so how do we take the prosperity of whatever level it is how do we take the prosperity that we do have and merge it on this intersect in this intersection of generosity and prosperity i think there's four steps that are there are wise financial stewardship of whatever we have been blessed with and prospered with the first step is tithing it's giving to the Lord. Now, let's just, let's just get that out of the way. Tithing, it started off in the Old Testament. Occasionally, I'll hear people say, well, tithing is an Old Testament thing. It's not New Testament. Well, yeah, it is. Yes, it very much is. Jesus, first of all, he said, I have not come to abolish anything in the law, but to fulfill the law and take it to a new level. He also said that he talked about the, all the things they were tithing, how they tied to this and that, and of their spices and of their land. and their property. He said, be sure you also tithing in, in your finances. He said, don't, don't, don't neglect any of that. Don't neglect that on any level. So it was an Old Testament principle to start off that was carrying on in the New Testament. But here's the deal in the New Testament. In the New Testament, Testament, it was kind of a starting point. It was a benchmark. It wasn't the end all because the New Testament does talk about sacrificial giving, about taking it to a different level. But the tithe originally in the Old Testament represented 10%. That's the, the term itself means 10%. And it's often, often mistaken. In fact, there's always the debate. Well, 10%. We're talking gross or net here, you know, which one is it? All right. Well, based on every other teaching in the Bible, it, it, it's first fruits. That means gross. That means the original. In fact, it was the original sibling controversy in the Bible. It was between Cain and Abel. And it's actually what caused Cain to kill Abel because Abel gave of the very best. He gave of the first fruits. He gave off the top. He gave off the gross. Cain, on the other hand, gave of the leftovers. And God blessed Abel's gift more than, or, or yeah, Abel's gift more than he can. Now, just think about it. Think about it. I won't even, I won't even do it, but I know that in this room, there are some of you that love leftovers, food. I know there's some of you in this room that won't eat leftover anything. When the meal's finished, whatever, it gets thrown away. I ain't touching a leftover. And, and you don't know what you're missing. But anyway, that's a different, sort of different. But, and so, but you think about this when it comes to giving. Is there anybody who would like to say, yeah, I'm going to give God my leftovers? That just doesn't even feel right, does it? Like, let's say we're not even talking about money. Let's say your, your neighbor has had a death in the family and you're trying to do something nice, you're trying to be generous and you decide you're going to take a meal next door to your neighbor. Are you going to take the leftover pizza from last night or are you going to cook them a meal or call Grubhub and send them a meal, whatever? I mean, we're, we're, we are giving of the first fruit and especially when it comes to the Lord. Giving leftovers doesn't make sense at all. It's, it's first fruits giving. Think about it. And when you think about it, really, not many of us, not many of us at all are blessed to the point that we could actually really be generous with leftovers. <laughs> the generosity is going to come off of what we're originally blessed with because it's a it's a trust issue do you trust god enough to provide for your needs when you give him off the very best that you have it's giving to god 
off the top, not the bottom. I'm, I'm blessed, and I've talked about this a lot, and won't rehash everything about it, but I was taught by, by my parents to tithe as a kid. I was blessed that when I met Kim, that she believed fully in tithing. We talked about it dating, and as, by the time, the first, as soon as we were married, we have never not tithed. And that's not to be anything boastful. That's just, it, it's been a blessing, because there's been many times that it's far, in fact, I can't remember the last time we weren't above a tithe somewhere, but I know this. Here's what I know. We've gone through a lot of stuff in our marriage, in our family and stuff. And we've had a lot of financial issues, but we've never not tithed and we've never been in trouble financially. I think there's a connection between the two that God has always provided. And we've looked back and looked, how did that happen? I don't know. God because we were faithful in the first part of it. So when we go through this intersection, I think it starts there. Here's what I'm going to promise you today. I mean, I'm going to rock your world. Just trust me. I'm about to rock your world. I am confident of this. I am 100% confident in this. I am 100% confident that God can do, or you can do more with 90% of your income and God's blessing than you can do with 100% of your income without God's blessing. I'm completely confident about that. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to make you an offer. If you aren't currently tithing, if you will start tithing at the first of the year or today, I'm pick your time. But if you'll start tithing and keep record of what that is, if after 90 days your life is worse than it was before, we'll refund your money. Because <laughs> I, I know it won't happen. I know it won't happen because God is faithful to his word. He said, I'll never take you somewhere and then forsake you. He's faithful to his word. And we just simply have to trust him. Until we put first, God first in our budget, we are going to have money trouble. Now, you can find all kinds of rich people, financially rich people that don't give a penny to God. So I'm not saying that they won't have money. I didn't say non-tithers wouldn't have money. I said they would have money trouble. Because here's what the Bible says. The Bible doesn't say that the love of money is the root of all evil. The Bible, say, or the Bible doesn't say that money is the root of all evil. It says that the love of money is the root of all evil. Because the difference between the two is having money and the love of money. And one of them has you and the other one you have it. All right. And so God says, trust me in this. Trust me in this. And see if I won't bless it. True prosperity begins by trusting God. Okay? So that's the first step. This intersection between generosity and prosperity is just trusting God and giving of the tithe. The second step is have an effective plan to get out of debt. Now, stay with me here. I get in our world today, it is virtually impossible to never, to not ever be in debt. It is very, I mean, your house, and that's needing to be where it kind of stops ideally. But you, you have to have a mortgage. Churches have to have some kind of mortgage to be able to have building and facilities. But, but it needs to be done well and financed well and paid off as quickly as possible. Because houses are almost impossible. By school loans, oh my goodness. And college isn't for everybody, but for some that really need to get that degree, and sometimes it's almost impossible to get up that school loan, and school loans are eating people alive. So the key question here is whether or not a debt that you have is manageable, and do you have a plan to pay it off, ideally, early? Because here's what's interesting. In the book of Proverbs, in the book of Proverbs in chapter 22 and verse 6, is a very familiar verse of scripture about parenting. It says, train up a child in the way they should go, and when they are old, they will not depart from it. Train up a child in the way they should go, and when they are old, they will not depart from it. You know what the very next verse in the Bible is? Verse 7, Proverbs 22. Proverbs 22, 7, the very next verse says, the rich rule over the poor. And the borrower is slave to the lender. It's like the wisest person that wrote the book of Proverbs, inspired by God, thought it was, it was important to say, parents train up a child, and oh, by the way, you better teach them about debt really quick. Because if not, it could eat them alive. I, I, know, I know far too many people who just, just to, how much is enough? Eh, the best definition of enough I know is just a little bit more. That's how the world teaches it. 
How much is enough? Just a little bit more. And so I know all kinds of people that have, have gotten, gotten great deals on cars. Absolutely great deals on cars. And it was such a great deal that they went to the lot thinking, oh, I can afford this. And, but oh no, we've got a great deal. And suddenly they've got this great deal on this great car that's actually more than indeed. And they're paying 18, 20, 22% interest on that in which they could have bought two cars for the same amount of money. See, if you have unmanageable debt, then you need to get to someone to help you figure out a plan that understands finances and can point out the flaws in it. Even if it's manageable, you need to have a plan to get out of debt as soon as possible because that's the, that's the better way to live. It allows us to fully live like God wants us to live. I, there's all kinds of plans on that. I personally think Dave Ramsey's debt snowball plan makes the most sense. It didn't to me at first because I thought, well, if you got multiple debts, then pay the biggest one off and get it off the plate. And Dave Ramsey teaches, and I went, oh, that makes sense. He just teaches, pay the smallest one off first and have a celebration. I actually got, I marked that one off the list. But then don't just go spend that extra money now. Take the money you're applying to the smallest one and apply it to the next one and to the next one and the next one. And before long, get everything off the plate except for your mortgage and then work on getting that one off the plate as soon as you can. But notice I said work. Because it is. It's not easy. It, it takes some work. It takes some diligence. And, but when it gets done... When you get down to just your mortgage or even none at all, man, you'll be so glad you did. So step number one is tithe and give to the Lord. Step number two is figure out a way to get out of debt. Step number three, live within your means. Live within your means. Now hear me clear. Listen, this, this isn't really important for me to say and everybody to hear. There is nothing wrong with having nice stuff. There's nothing wrong with having a nice vehicle. There's nothing wrong with having nice clothes. There's nothing wrong with having a nice house. The question we always have to ask ourselves is, is this what I can afford? If it's more than I can afford, but I really like it, it's a dangerous cliff to be on. Look, I want you to look in the Bible, Luke chapter 12, all right? Jesus is asked a question there. He's actually petitioned by someone to help them, to help, to help them settle a, uh, an estate, uh, to settle a financial estate. And Jesus in chapter 12 of Luke, in verse 15, says, Be careful. Be on your guard against every kind of greed, because life is not measured by how much you own. And then he told him a story. And that really means when it says Jesus told him a story, it's a parable. It's a made-up story that he used to illustrate a situation. All right? He said there's a rich man who had a fertile farm and produced fine crops, going well for him. And he said to himself, what should I do? I don't have any room for all of my crops. It's been a bumper year. It's been a great year. And he said, I know what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and expense and I'll build bigger ones, another expense, and then I'll have room enough to store all of my wheat and other goods. And I'll sit back and say to myself, friend, you have enough stored away for years to come. Now take it easy, eat, drink, and be merry. And then verse 20 is important. Jesus said, God said to him, you fool, you will die this very night. And then who will get everything that you work for? Yes, a person is a fool to store up earthly wealth and not have a relationship with God. All those things are fine. The nice house, the nice car, the nice clothes. But when we go after those things and lose our, or miss out or leave out our relationship with God, we got a problem. It, it, it's kind of funny to me. And I just say, kind of preach to the choir here. But it's kind of funny to me. Every year, everybody thinks church attendance in December is enormous because of Christmas. But it's, it's actually not. It's, it's actually kind of one of the lower months in a lot of years. You know why? Because of Saturday night Christmas parties. Think that through. The, 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 the corporate, the secular world throws these elaborate Saturday night Christmas parties and, and Christians go to them. They work at the... But don't come to worship the one that's... I, you know, it's like... We're like, we get things out of whack. There's nothing wrong with having stuff. As long as stuff doesn't have us. 
and we need to live within our means. Sometimes that might mean a smaller house, and it's really easy to, oh, you can afford a little bit more. Rates are great. I can get you this deal. It might mean just getting a house that's a little bit smaller. It might mean not having the newest cell phone that's out there. I, I, you know, I don't know. I, 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 I understand, like, Apple's on, they're actually on a double-digit number, and, and I'm not anywhere close to that, and some of you guys got flip phones. So, you know, it may mean not having the newest cell phone on the market. It may mean driving an older model car. It may mean your kids playing for the less expensive travel team and only playing for one team at once. By the way, that money will never be recouped in scholarship. I promise you that. I promise you that. It may mean choosing Gatlinburg over Miami Beach or Disney World. See, having discipline to live less extravagantly than the top end of your income, here's what it does. It creates less stress in your life. You may want less stress in your life. Creates less stress. It gives you margin and peace and in turn allows you to be more generous. You know, the book of Proverbs has got so much wisdom in it. So much wisdom in it. Proverbs chapter 13 is just packed full of good wisdom. Look at these three verses from Proverbs 13 and what they say about how we manage our finances. One person pretends to be rich, is verse 7, yet has nothing. Another person pretends to be poor, yet has great wealth. Hmm. Verse 11 says, dishonest money dwindles away. But whoever gathers money little by little makes it grow. Makes sense. Verse 18 says, whoever disregards discipline comes to poverty and shame. But whoever heeds correction is honored. You know, it, it's difficult having conversations about finances. I, I get that. It's difficult sitting down and talking to someone. In, in fact, it's, I, I get that anytime that someone has to ask for financial help, there's a part of that ask that's embarrassing. But it, it, here's also what I know. It's a whole lot less embarrassing to ask for financial advice on the front end than to have to ask for money on the back end. All right? And, and, and so we need to learn to live within our means. And then finally, lastly, the final step is just to invest wisely. It, it, it's to give and to trust God. Number two, to have a plan to get out of debt. Number three, to live within your means. And the final step is to invest wisely. See, you don't have to start life with a silver spoon in your mouth to be financially successful. You just have to be wise with what you have and invest it well. Mark Jones, who, as you guys know, we always write sermons and stuff together. He sent me this quote this week. He said, compound interest is the eighth wonder of the world. Amen. Uh, people, young people a lot of times don't understand that. Don't understand what compound interest looks like. They also don't understand, especially what it looks like on the back end of it when they're paying that 22% on a car loan or whatever and what that'll do to you. But I love, I've always loved this illustration. Some of you guys know this and you're going to know where this is going already. I've always loved this illustration about if you start the first day of a month with a penny and then you double that every day of the month at how much it will do for you. Day, day, day one, you got two cents, then, day, then four cents, then eight cents, then 16 cents, then 32 cents. And by the end of the first week, you've got a whopping dollar and 28 cents. Yay! But by the end of the second week, you've got $163.84. Well, that starts to get your attention a little bit more. By the end of the third week, you've got $20,971.52. And if the month has 31 days, you end up at the end of day 31 with $21,474,800 uh, Now, I don't know where you got all those pennies, but that may be another issue. But that's just a, that would be hard to do. But that's a visual illustration of how much and how quickly things can change if you manage it well. And that's an extreme example, but Chris Hogan, who works with Dave Ramsey, uh, has figured out that if you could save $35 a week, $35 a week, and invest it at even at 10%, that in 20 years you would have $110,000. In 30 years, 330,000. In, in 40 years or retirement, you would have 890,000. And if you could only increase that interest level by 2% and start drawing 12%, you'd end up with $1.5 million. Compound interest is an amazing thing. 
but it takes work. It's investing wisely. It's making good choices about what we do with what we've been blessed with. I, I, I've known for a long time, and I'm confident about this, that the best overall plan for living is 10, 10, 80. 10% to God, 10% invested to savings, and live off 80%. And if you do that for life, you'd be amazed at what, what's going to be able to happen in your life. And then maybe you get a little bit successful and you do say, well, we want to take it to a different level. And if you just up it to 15, 15, 70, man, it gets crazy. You say, well, I could never do that. You'd be surprised because whatever your income this is this year, in a, in a few years, 70% of your income will be equal to what 80% is right now. And that gives you the margin to be able to do even more. But it takes work. It takes investing wisely. And we need to come back to Scripture. Look back in 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Look at verse 6 where we left off before. Jesus is still teaching. He says, a farmer who plants only a few seeds uh, will, get a, will get small crops. Paul's teaching. Excuse me, Paul's teaching. Uh, a farmer who gets a few seeds will get a small crop. But the one who plants generously will get a generous crop. You must each, here's the key, this is important, underline this. You must each decide in your heart how much to give. Then that's an that's a early ahead of time decision. That's not spur of the moment. Oh, what do you think we ought to do? That's praying about it and choosing to do where God leads you, all right? Don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure. For God loves a person who gives cheerfully. You know that word cheerfully right there in the text? You know what the Greek word is there? It, it's a Greek word that's pronounced hilaros. Does that sound like anything? Yeah, it's the exact same word that we get hilarious from. In other words, what Paul said is God wants a giver that is just excited about it, that's smiling when they give. It's like, like it, it's time to give and just break out in laughter. I'm excited about this. And God will give generously and provide all the and God will give generously and provide all that you need then you will always have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others as well as the scriptures say they share freely and give generously to the poor their good deeds will be remembered forever for God is the one who provides a seed for the farmer and then bread to eat in the same way he will provide and increase your resources and then produce a great harvest of generosity in you. See, if we choose to be wise and faithful and invest and spend wisely and give generously, we'll find ourselves able to give really generously to our children, our grandchildren, our church, our college, our hospital, whatever is important to us, if we manage what God has blessed us with. See, God makes some pretty big promises to those who are generous. You know why he makes those promises? Because he loves us. He really loves us. And he wants to love us at huge levels. He wants us to be able to take care of ourselves and our families, of course. But then take a look at verse 11, the, the inverse in this particular text. He says, you will be made rich in every way, not just financially, in every way, so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. See, rich is a relative term. Rich is a relative term. When you hear that God will make you rich, I know some people, and that's where the prosperity gospel gets all messed up. Some people are tempted that it means, think it means that God's going to give you this really high paying job, even if you don't deserve it, or see your investments are profitable, like your stock is going to always be going up and to the right, or, or even work it out if, if you get an unexpected inheritance and that just, that just stuff. But here's the truth. A person is rich if they have more than they need. A person is rich if they have more than they need. And I'm convinced that God at times gives us more than we need so we can help those who have less than what they need. The writer of Hebrews put it this way in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5. They wrote, don't love money. Be satisfied with what you have. For God said, I will never fail you. I'll never abandon you. 
And I know that sometimes when, when the, 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 the struggles and the trials of this world seem huge and overwhelming, and instead of turning over to God, sometimes we just, we dig our own hole. And it just keeps getting deeper and deeper instead of just trusting God. And as I said every week in this series, none of this makes sense if Jesus Christ isn't Lord of your life. Because, but making him the Lord of your life means surrendering. It means I'm going to trust you in this. I'm going to step out in faith. I'm going to trust you in this. So I'm going to ask if you guys would, I'm going to ask you to stand right now. And as we're going to worship with one more song, and Ethan and the team are going to lead us in this last song, and, and Jason's going to be down here at the front. Maybe you just need to sing and worship. Jason and Elizabeth are down here. Dennis is back here. we got folks that if you do feel whatever kind of need, uh, just to have someone pray with you about something, or if maybe it's something this week. It didn't have to be today. Maybe this week God said, this is the day that you need to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. So while we worship together, if you need to talk to someone, make some kind of decision, then come on down here and let's just worship together, okay? Let's just worship.
guys, uh, Ethan kind of shared his parting thoughts uh, at the beginning. And I just want to finish the service by saying thanks. I love you probably more than you'll ever know. And it's been a great two years. And I believe with all of my heart. I believe with all of my heart that two years ago, God led us to E-Town. And I choose to believe with all my heart that two years later, God led E-Town back and led Ethan back to E-Town for such a time as this, as the Bible talks about. So we talked this week. I told people in first service, you know, I talked this week, said, you know, it's only an hour and 15 minutes. So that if like down the road, like if we have a week that we need somebody, we're calling. And uh, so because we don't know exactly where God's going to lead us yet. But we know he's leading and we're trusting in that. Uh, we've also um, locked down uh, that man who's Ethan's dad. Said, man, you still got to come and do the bass thing for us, man. <laughs> Because uh, Jerry, Jerry was doing that years ago, and so we've been knowing him for a long time. But I just wanted to, to pray over Ethan and allow you guys to, to do that. And uh, then I've asked him after service is over. He'll just be down here at the front for a little bit. If you want to come up and say something, remember that in just a few minutes he has to do this one more time. So, uh, but if you just want to come down and say thanks. But right now, I just want to pray, and maybe if you just want to reach your hand out symbolically and let him know that you're praying over him. Let's just go to God, all right? Uh, God, you are special. You are awesome. You are good. And for two years, you've, uh, you've allowed this incredible young man to uh, use his energy and creativity and enthusiasm to lead us to your throne each and every week. And so we thank you for that. I thank you for the teams that he and Todd have built that are going to allow us to just keep moving forward. And so God, I pray that you will bless him in the days and weeks to come as he reestablishes a ministry in Elizabethtown. And God, I pray that you'll continue to bless us as we search for the next person to come here and to step into Ethan's shoes and just take us to another new level. And I just love seeing that progression time after time as transitions are made that you just take us to another level and so God I just uh, pray I just pray the blessings of numbers 23 all over Ethan that you would just anoint him in a very special way and God we're going to look back at this and look at your hand and see what great works you've done in the powerful name of Jesus we pray amen amen now here I get uh, We've done it before, like when we've given a gift and taken it back every service, and that seemed kind of hokey. So there's more of you in here. So Ethan here on behalf of uh, the church family, oh, just want to say thanks. I just want to say thanks. All right, you guys know the deal. Go love God. Love people. Let's change the world. See you guys.